Hi, I'm Luke Chow from the Morpheus Clinic for Hypnosis in Toronto, Canada. In one of my other videos, I talked about hypnosis myths often believed in by the general public. In this video, I'm going to share my thoughts on some hypnosis myths promoted by other hypnotherapists. Now, I know this video has the chance to cause a bit of controversy. I know it's going to shake things up a little bit, but I do believe that there is no such thing as orthodox in the hypnotherapy world that the uh, free market of ideas and that different opposing differing ideas coming together is how you come up with better ideas. So if you are a hypnotherapist and you're offended by anything I'm saying here, please make a response video or leave a comment in the comments and we'll open up a public discussion about the ideas I'm presenting here. The first idea I'm going to challenge is the idea that hypnosis is completely safe. And I think this idea comes from the fact that somebody going into hypnosis and then coming back out again is just going into a very natural half awake and half asleep state. And people do that all the time without being harmed. So the reason I'm challenging this is because when people hear that hypnosis is completely safe, they take that to mean that anything that happens during hypnosis is also completely safe. And that's confusing the state of mind, which is harmless, with what can happen during hypnosis or what's suggested during hypnosis, which depends entirely on the practitioner that you get. I believe in learning the risks and learning how to practice in a risk-aware way rather than pretending that hypnosis is totally safe. Examples of risks that can happen during hypnosis are that a client can uncover a memory, often spontaneously, of something that was traumatic and that they're not yet ready or able to deal with. And all of a sudden the floodgates are opened, and it might be the wrong time in their life for them to have to deal with that. It's rare, but it can happen. Um, Another example is that if the hypnotist is careless with language, it is possible for wrong ideas or bad ideas to enter the client's mind. Another risk that I teach is that if the practitioner is not qualified to work with a serious issue, then trying to work with a serious issue just delays proper treatment for that issue. Those are just three of the risks that I'll share with hypnotherapists and hypnotherapy students behind the scenes. There are more, but if you get a well-trained, skilled, conscientious practitioner, if you have someone who's ethical, who's working with you, the risk can be mitigated. Just to use an analogy, it's kind of like asking whether or not cooking is safe or whether or not the use of a chef's knife is safe. If you are skilled, if you are conscientious, if you use it carefully in ways that are aware of the risks, then yes, cooking is a very safe activity. Cutting up a carrot with a chef's knife is a safe activity. But you have to be aware of the risks rather than being oblivious to them, and that's why I'm challenging the standard party line that hypnosis is totally safe. Another common statement made by hypnotherapists is the idea that the brain or the mind cannot tell the difference between what's real and what's imagined. And to me, that's something that hypnotists say to overstate the power of the imagination. While the imagination can be very powerful in that you can plan out or create or imagine something that doesn't exist yet before you create it, still, the mind is able to tell the difference between what's real and what's imagined in a normal waking state and usually in hypnosis as well in deeper levels of hypnosis um, or when you're actually dreaming in that situation you can't tell the difference between what's real and what's imagined someone who is severely mentally ill might hallucinate or might be delusional and thereby not be able to tell the difference between what's real and what's imagined but mentally healthy people in a waking state or even in a lighter state of hypnosis, are able to tell the difference between what's real and what's imagined. They can feel in reaction to what they imagine. Their imagination might inspire them, but they can still tell that it's imaginary. Another idea often promoted by hypnotists, and more broadly by many um, mental health practitioners, is that all fears are caused by trauma, and therefore, the treatment of those fears necessarily requires you to revisit that trauma. Now, the mental health field 
is still, relatively speaking, in its infancy. Within a few hundred years, we're going to look back on what we're doing in the early part of the 21st century and be horrified by many current best practices. So, I'm saying this with a grain of humility in that I also don't know what the best treatment is and I also don't know how to do much better than we're doing right now. But I do believe we're making a lot of mistakes and I do believe that we'll find ways to help people with their problems without requiring them to revisit past trauma. In the work that I do using hypnotherapy, almost everything I do is present and future looking. We're imagining a better future. We're believing in a better future. We're teaching clients how to see things differently so that from that moment onward, they're able to be in a situation such as public speaking and have a very different attitude toward the audience, toward the silence, toward being in front of everybody. And that doesn't require people to revisit the past and it doesn't require people to revisit past trauma. There are some fears that I believe are more common than not and that are not necessarily rooted in trauma. For example, we human beings are social animals. We grew up in relatively small tribes. In the past, if we were kicked out of the tribe, a, a person who was ostracized would probably starve to death or be exposed to the elements or would be killed off by a wild, wild animal. We human beings evolved to be social and to um, to interact coherently in societies. Because we are a social animal, we all want to do well in front of others. We all want to be part of the group. We all want to be popular. We all want to say things that are agreed upon and accepted by others, which means we all want to avoid failing in front of others. We all want to avoid criticism from peers. We all want to avoid situations where we are at a heightened risk of being ostracized. And I would suggest that this is innate to human nature and not rooted in traumatic experiences. It's true that if you take any emotion, whether a negative emotion, a so-called negative emotion, or a positive emotion, and you trace it back through the client's memories, you will find early experiences where the client first felt fear or first felt fear in front of a group. You'll find situations where they first felt happiness and where they first felt love as well. That doesn't mean that those events caused their present day fear. It just means those events are the first times that they felt those specific feelings. In a situation where a fear is normal for a human being, trying to look for trauma in the past often turns into a wild goose chase and I believe it's more effective to teach the client how to see things or how to approach things such that their endeavors are not as threatening or not as intimidating. Another idea promoted primarily by hypnotists and not so much by people who are from cultures that sincerely believe in this is that a lot of people's problems are rooted in past life experiences that one, reincarnation happens after death, two, memories from previous incarnations are passed on, and three, hypnosis is how you uncover these past life memories. Now, people who believe in reincarnation might believe the second point, but rarely do, do they believe that commercialized hypnosis is how you figure out who you were in past lives. It ends up being a topic of almost religious discussion in that it's impossible to falsify and it's a more of a matter of, um, of belief or faith than it is in something that is empirically studied. I am aware that there are a number of books published by popular authors that make a case for reincarnation. But there are also books published by other authors that make a case for almost anything, including that aliens built the pyramids. So one person promoting an idea that isn't accepted by mainstream science, I would automatically look at as requiring a high burden of proof. Whether or not we human beings actually are reincarnated after we die, and whether or not we pass on memories to the next incarnation is a matter beyond the scope of this video. 
and in my opinion, beyond the scope of what I do with clients professionally. I believe that it's more of a matter of religion or spirituality than it is a matter of professional practice, and that's why I will not do past life regression. The other reason for it is that I've never had to. Earlier in this video, I challenged the idea that present-day fears are necessarily based on past traumas. Well, people who practice past life regression take it a step further in saying that the past traumas aren't even in this lifetime. And I think that does people a disservice because if they in fact have trauma in this lifetime, then looking for trauma in a past lifetime completely misdirects them from the actual source of their problems. In other cases, if you aren't able to find trauma in this lifetime, chances are the problem is a result of being human, more so than in past lives. If the Dalai Lama issues a statement saying that commercialized hypnosis is how you figure out who you were in a past life, I will revise my stance on this point. But unless a spiritual authority on reincarnation says something like that, I wouldn't take uh, popular authors to be authorities on the topic. Another idea promoted by hypnotherapists, which, like many of the points that I've touched upon here in this video, is more for the benefit of hypnotherapists than for the public, is the idea that anybody can be hypnotized. I believe that almost everybody can learn how to go into hypnosis with enough time, patience, energy, and effort. I don't believe that everybody is naturally a good hypnotic subject or a natural hypnotic subject. I do believe that there is a segment of the population for whom hypnosis is the long way around. During my consultations, I try to identify if someone fits into this category and then I recommend alternative next steps. Um, most people can be hypnotized relatively easily within a matter of minutes. Some people can very easily be hypnotized and go very deep very quickly. Um, but I, I don't think we can ignore the fact that some people are just hard to hypnotize. And unless they are willing to put the time, the energy, the money if necessary to learn how to go into hypnosis by suspending their disbelief, by suspending criticism, then um, hypnosis would, for those people, be the long way around. Another popular misconception is the idea that in hypnosis, we remember everything that's ever happened to us. And it's because of the false analogy between the human brain and a computer. A computer, unless it's somehow overheating or buggy or broken, a computer will be able to play back moment by moment a video or a slideshow of an event perfectly. The human mind and human memory does not work like this. The human brain is not like a computer, it's not like a video camera, at least not when it comes to the recollection of memories. Um, if you want to do a deeper dive into this, look up the work of Elizabeth Loftus. She's the world's foremost researcher on false memory syndrome. She's done quite a bit of work, um, and I don't think any of it actually involves formal hypnosis. But it does involve researchers verbally suggesting false memories that the uh, subjects later recall um, to a fairly high degree and with a high degree of confidence. And it reveals a few things. One, confidence in a memory does not make the memory more true or more real. Two, there is such a thing as false memories. And three, it's possible to implant false memories through verbal suggestion. Her work is utterly fascinating and very enlightening. I'm just going to summarize in this video the idea that we do not remember everything and what we think we remember, even if we have a lot of confidence, is often more imagination than memory. The last idea I'm going to touch upon is the idea that the unconscious mind is all wise or all knowing or all understanding or somehow has all the answers you're looking for. And where I'm going to challenge the idea is by pointing out some inconsistencies. Um, first of all, uh, the unconscious mind, it is said, 
is the reason why people smoke cigarettes against their best interests. It's why people eat junk food even though they know it's bad for them. They do these kinds of behaviors because of their feelings, because of their habits, because of associations or messages instilled when they were at a young age. If the unconscious mind is the same part of a person that is responsible for their overeating or their smoking habit or their irrational fears, how is the same part of the mind suddenly all intelligent or all wise or all seeing or all knowing when it comes to other problems? I've heard hypnotherapists talk about the unconscious mind, or sometimes they'll say the, the subconscious mind, almost like it's a deity, almost like it's all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-seeing. Just because the unconscious mind is outside of conscious awareness, it doesn't mean we have to ascribe all these qualities to it. It used to be that human beings would gaze up at the stars and not be able to comprehend them, and see patterns in them that we now call constellations. Today in the 21st century, we often gaze into our inner worlds, seeing a bit of glimmer, seeing a few things come out, seeing some patterns, but yet most of it is poorly understood. And I would posit that it's a mistake to ascribe these kinds of superhuman qualities to the unconscious mind. So those are my thoughts on some ideas commonly promoted by other hypnotherapists in this field. You might agree or you might disagree, but those are my thoughts on those topics. I know that we human beings will be debating the mind and human nature for centuries yet to come. That the human mind is one of the last frontiers for science to explore and discover. I do not want to give the impression that I know or that I think I know all the answers. I've challenged these ideas because to me there's a very logical counter argument. If you disagree please leave a comment or make a reaction video. I do hope to stir up some discussion in the public sphere. Until next time I'm Luke Chow from the Morpheus Clinic for Hypnosis in Toronto, Canada. We make hypnosis make sense.